Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Cambridge, Massachusetts. We're here at the Hyatt at the CDO IQ conference, the 18th annual Chief Data Officer Symposium. Used to be at MIT at the Tang Center. This is the Cube's eighth year. Myself, Paul Gillen, Sanjeev Mohan. Paul, eight, year, eight years doing the CDO IQ. I feel old, Dave. We've seen... <laughs> you look good. <laughs> We've seen the ascendancy of the Chief Data Officer from this sort of back office, sort of wonky data quality uh, position to one that now is front and center with the whole Gen AI movement. John Spence is here. He's a head of data and AI for North America at ThoughtWorks, leading thought leader in the industry. John, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Thank you for having me. So uh, what's going on at CDO IQ? Um, are you speaking here? Are you just interacting with customers? What, what's, what's, your, what's your role here? Well, I am or I have been leading a panel, and we have a couple of our clients also talking as well, but I think my role here, my, my passion here, is getting to interact with all the great practitioners. CDOIQ has so many talented people, it's a great learning opportunity. So first and foremost, on a personal level, I enjoy the opportunity for learning from all these people. Yeah, so um, you guys, obviously, we were talking off camera, you were heavily involved in decentralized architectures, participating in the whole data mesh movement uh, that Jamak Degani coined and documented so, so eloquently. Uh, where are we at now with the data mesh movement? Um, we... We, we saw data mesh, and of course, Gartner had to come up with data fabric because they did. They got to invent every term, not to man, and that <laughs> little and women uh, that, that that caused some confusion. But it seems like things have settled down a little bit. But where are we with with data mesh? No, I think that's a great way to describe it. Things are settling down. We're figuring out what works and what doesn't. Jamak took her experiences and mapped out a set of principles that were highly effective and and really changed how people thought about delivering data solutions. And over the past five years, since we just celebrated the anniversary of that article, ThoughtWorks has been working with our clients to put those practices in place and learn what changes are necessary to truly make Data Mesh successful. Mm. One of the concepts that seems to have resonated most strongly out of Data Mesh is this idea of data as a product. How are your uh, clients internalizing that idea? How are they how are they uh, applying it in their organizations? Oh, you're absolutely right. Uh, the principle most quickly embraced by, by our clients, by individuals I talked to, by myself, was that idea of thinking of data as a product, how you're delivering it to the people who are consuming it, making sure they're successful, crossing that last mile with those consumers. And our clients, as I said, embrace that, that concept. The, interesting experience for them and for most practitioners is bringing people in who are now data product managers. So bringing together those skills of product thinking, design thinking with those hard skills of understanding how to use these, these solutions, the technologies that are involved, the roles of data governance. So we are creating another unicorn in our industry, this individual called the data product owner. So helping those organizations we work with develop those talents and build that cadre of, of product owners is one of the biggest challenges they face. Well, you mentioned design thinking. How does design thinking fit into data product management? One of our experiences in the technology industry has been we have to start thinking, stop thinking about what our clients might be asking us for directly and really exploring what they need. So taking a step back and thinking about how that data will be consumed, you know, the, the, the old Ford adage, hey, if I gave people what they wanted, it would, would have been faster horses. There are times where, and especially now with, with the introduction, introduction of AI, we have the opportunity to circumvent old processes and produce more useful solutions if we understand what the need is, what our, our customers, our data consumers are trying to produce. So thinking about those principles, uh, the data ownership, which I always found was, okay, that's like a starting point. You got to get everybody together and agree on who owns what data as product. I think generally people are comfortable with, with data as product. Self-service, I mean, I think with, with cloud, everybody kind of has self-service on their mind, but the hardest of the four principles was that sort of federated governance. I think it was, you called it federated computational governance, which I right. heard was, was a, a high degree of automation. So we didn't have to have uh, hall monitors, you know, <laughs> worrying about this. So. So uh, is that 
is that what you find with clients that sort of the starting point is one and if you can get that right things start to flow but then you run into number four which is the big gap in the in the business today yes uh, it that is absolutely the path that most individuals go down in sort of understanding data mesh and the experience too is when you start to think of data as a product and delivering these products well when when Jamak put forward the the principles of DATSIS or the FAIR principles for data that we're familiar with, describing how data has to be uh, um, findable and it needs to be interoperable, all of those characteristics, you start to understand how governance plays such a critical role in ensuring that data is readily consumable. So I think that most organizations, most practitioners that we work with follow that journey of understanding, all right, if this data is going to be consumable by these different organizations, now I'm starting to get the idea. And the federated model is simply saying, as we move to scale, we understand that we need to engage the whole organization. Like that saying, quality is job one, quality is everybody's job. Data quality is everyone's job. So now how do we distribute, how do we federate that responsibility? Because like a federal system, you still need that strong centralized policy uh, creation group, the, the, the compliance and risk individuals who are driving, this is why it's really important to keep this data secure, protected, and at high quality, but then enabling the organization to act on that. And of course, using automation as a, as a way to ensure that happens. We've seen some uh, progress this year with the open sourcing of, uh, of um, Snowflake's data catalog with the industry really being to come together around the iceberg format and, mm -hmm. and the standard for a uh, standard data platform for lake, lakes and lake houses. Does this change the equation somehow? Or are your, are your clients uh, thinking differently because they have access because these standards are emerging? So being from ThoughtWorks where, you know, we are, have long been uh, espousers, passionate uh, adopters of, of open source software, we're celebrating in a way the, this move that was seen. And, and I've been in the data industry for over 30 years. And so that move from very singular, large proprietary solutions to an open source format, more of that sharing, we're seeing, yes, our clients are able to make more granular decisions about the technologies they leverage. And they're getting the opportunity to evolve their technology strategy more rapidly because they have the opportunity to swap those in there's the greater interoperability but is, is this a technology first phenomenon i mean do they have to get their their governance house in order before they think about what technologies they use i've got to say no because nobody's ever done that nobody's gotten their governance house in order first it's always been that that cleanup effort afterwards when they realize that's the real challenge i think it has been one of the struggles in our industry is that organizations do think of it as a technology first problem and data in my experience my opinion is is that greatest representation of the intersection of technology and the business it's how we're describing how the business operates how the business is operating right now with bits and bytes and so understanding the, all of those definitions how things work what it means when we say oh, this is our performance or these are this is the cost of building that that tractor. We need the definitions from the business. So if we don't start with an organizational and business first mindset, we're going to just build new technology. It, and that's the, the the frankly the brilliance of ThoughtWorks business model. I mean, you've always, you know, in in our industry, you remember Netware Consultants. Oh God, right? Yes, the Cisco CCIE. Or you could have a consultancy to do that type of stuff, and then you get sort of locked into that. That, that domain, and then when the domain you know gets disrupted, you get disrupted. But so ThoughtWorks, it seems to me anyway, publicly has always tried to avoid picking winners of technologies with the understanding that that the customer is going to have multi multitude of, of, of tech. And I think that's the case here with these these catalogs. You mentioned you know Snowflake with Polaris. Um, they're kind of keeping Horizon to themselves. You got Unity Catalog, which Matei on stage made open source. You've got Microsoft doing Purview, which is going to be a catalog of catalogs. You got AWS with Glue and Data Zones, and they got different meta. So your customers have it all. So they do. It's it, you're never going to be able to to solve it with you know all the wood behind one arrow, to use a Scott McNeely term. So having said that, how do you see 
this sort of picking up on Paul's question. If I if I can't get my governance act in order beforehand, your response to that was, yeah, you kind of figure it out after after. But it can't so called can't be a bolt on either. So I can help square that circle for me, John. How do I not bolt on governance as an afterthought and yet put in a governance uh, structure? And I think the answer is going to be from a it's going to be a business answer, but I'd like to hear it. How do I do that given all these choices that I have? And I know my business is going to some are going to the data scientists are going to choose uh, uh, Unity. My 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 data warehouse guys are going to choose you know Horizon and 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 maybe uh, uh, Polar. You know, and and my AWS guys, my cloud architects are going to choose AWS. How do you make sure that? that the governance can actually be federated and automated? It is a, it's a fantastic question. And our approach with our clients in trying to tear this apart is to start small, is to work in a, in a single, singular or set of simple use cases with the eye to the future. We're not just going to build one thing because then we'll just create yet another silo of, of a different technology and a different challenge, but saying, we are going to implement not just the technology, but we're going to put the entire process in place for a selected set of, of use cases and subsequently a selected set of data. So we're gonna do the full steel thread through the entire process rather than trying to change the whole organization and build momentum for it. So, so you're giving people what they want. They want one, they wanna see something come out of their investments. They want some sort of tangible return, even if it's minuscule. They want to see a path forward to how their organizations are going to change. So we use a model we call it show, shift, and scale. Demonstrate the value, shift from a proof of value to a way of working, and then scale it across the enterprise. So that it's a journey. I, I, there, it's, it's not a silver bullet. It takes time. And the, the panelists that we were talking to today or all of our clients who have been on this journey, somewhere between six months and three years, and as, as one of them said, this is not an endpoint. This is just a step in our evolution. And so taking that evolutionary approach is near and dear to our hearts and has been the greatest way to make our clients successful. I know, yeah, I know one of your panelists was from Pfizer and 90,000 people and everybody's very opinionated about what they, how they do things there. I mean, how does an organization like that that's, that's very siloed and really siloed by design create any kind of unified governance? Right, uh, and and to be clear too, um, that panelist is it was uh, part, as he said in his session, is part of an acquisition, and so he's just gone from CGen, a, a, a small oncology focused firm, to Pfizer, and so he's he's grappling with those very right. challenges himself. Um, you do need to. The experience that we've had that has never been successful has been to try and say, listen, we're all going to sing from the same hymn though. we're all going to jump in this together and we're going to change the whole organization we have to build the momentum so you're right a large organization like pfizer working with uh we want we work in federal space very large organizations there driving that change is got to have first support those champions but drive it incrementally across the organization and it's it's more of a viral approach to bring that change you know paul one of the first sort of case studies I ever did was, um, so I'm looking at now, July 2021, how J.P. Morgan is implementing right. a data mesh. Data mesh. And so, at, and that was a really good example, John, of somebody starting, I don't know if you guys were involved, but they were starting small, right? And, and but I remember saying, okay, wh where do they, do they have a roadmap and a journey? And, and we, we talked to them and they gonna recognize the importance of that, but they're like, look, we just wanted to dive in and learn. And, but there was glue and there was di catalogs and there was the, the Hadoop legacy stuff. I did another one with HelloFresh, as you might recall. Mm -hmm. And they had a really completely different approach. Although, by the way, Hadoop was still part of that. So it'd be interesting to go back and you'd be really good at this and seeing how these guys have evolved, um, whether it was a, a cul-de-sac, you know, kind of one-way door, as some people say, or whether they actually could evolve it in that way. Are there examples... Um, you know, now that the data mesh has been out for, you just say five years is my yeah. anniversary. Are there examples of folks that started small and have been able to successfully, your clients been able to successfully extend that, that start small and, and are on that path? Yes. Yes, we do have some clients that's, um, in talking about them, 
bringing out names in front of cameras. I'm you can't do. Yeah, but but you, you mentioned I think the Pfizer because they were public in a panel. Right, right they were in a panel. And but, and in, but, yeah, I get it. But but even generically, sure. And the interesting thing is, in the life sciences space, we have a number of clients who we've helped on this journey and have gone on for multiple years on the journey and expanded across their organizations. And so we have seen that success. We and you know, especially working in the life sciences space, moving either starting in the clinical trial space or in the discovery space, but then moving through into the commercial process, moving through the entire value chain as they start to see that value have the impact. So we have seen multiple organizations, a number of organizations, I should say, that have gone on that journey, particularly life sciences. We've had some in manufacturing. So it, it, it is there. The the thing that differentiates, it was interesting, a conversation I had down at one of the tables, people are saying, well, people aren't patient and they can't wait for, for those results. And I said, that's right. You have to find those pioneers, those people who see the, the big investment, the long tail benefit and are willing to show that patience because they know there will be some return. Now, eventually, as technology evolves, we'll solve the problems for the, the pioneers' problems and we can bring that back to the people who move quicker. And in those examples, what has been the business impact? It sounds like it still may be somewhat fuzzy. What are the and what are the primary sort of barriers to achieving the vision? Are they are they technological or are they organization? I mean, maybe maybe a little bit of both. But I wonder if you could look yeah. at it. So so the benefits in in life sciences space and an interesting learning for me was. Um, Drugs are going to come to market. They are expensive and take a long time. Our biggest opportunity is actually finding out the, the ones that fail as quick as possible. Move the chips to the best bet, as it was explained to me. Mm -hmm. So we have helped organizations uh, accelerate the process of, of killing uh, off those, those non-viable treatments. And so that's been a, a, re a successful return for us and for our clients. So we've seen success in that. We've seen success in a number of industries where the complex one particular, a complex manufacturing chains where the, the cost of scrap, the cost of, uh, of the loss of, of productivity has been dramatically reduced in m multiple digits. So those are the benefit types of benefits because we cross, we enable what data has always tried to do, cross organizational boundaries, cross domains. Now, the challenges, overwhelmingly, they are organizational. The technology challenges with the rapid pace of innovation right now, if there's a true technical challenge, well, there's somebody at Google, at, at AWS, at Databricks, wherever, solving that problem right now. But the organizational challenge, the fact that these source systems are owned by people who are focused on one responsibility and these data consumers have a very different responsibility that's where the friction mm -hmm. lies. And I've experienced that, you know, since the nineties. I love that been a business benefit example. I was bring things back to horse racing, Kentucky Derby. There's 22 horses. You got, you got to throw somebody out. So, <laughs> you know, and you're helping you pick better, you know, put, put the, put, bet on the sure, sure thing. Well, to be clear, examples. we haven't worked with any horse, uh, racing. No, <laughs> uh, great business. But the two examples <laughs> you cited were both cost, cost production, uh, clinical trials and, and uh, saving on, on scrap. Is that the best place to start? I think it's the mo often the most tangible. Um, when you talk about, you know, for, for example, when you talk about accelerating uh, the drug discovery process, that's a very open-ended question. There's a, there's a lot of risk in there. But if I talk about reducing cost, reducing uh, pain and friction in the process, that's a great place to start. But the interesting point that comes from that was working with uh, uh, actually one of the... Um, record producing companies that don't call that them and it call them that anymore but um they had a very uh arduous process of coming up with quarterly results and so we accelerated that and we made it a push button and then now the thing that happened was yes we reduced the amount of effort required to get that report out that analysis out but what we also did was gave them the ability the insight to know how our performance is not at the end of the quarter or not <laughs> two months later but right now so being able to take those snapshots and start looking at how the performance is now it moves from cost reduction the effort that people or the effort of the people to produce those rewards to we have greater insight and that translates into things like uh, variable pricing and demand pricing 
So that that ability to insight starts often with a cost reduction, but then now you know something and you can do something. Was that a virtual close you're describing in a quarter? Within in, in a quarter to three weeks, ten weeks in, you could do a virtual close. Is that yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we were able to we were able to get that down to a period of about it would run through and reconciliation. You always have to do right, that. Right. So we could we could complete that in about a course of a, a week, which had taken the full quarter before. Right. Amazing. All right, hey, we got to run. John, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time and your insights and congratulations. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. All right, keep it right there. Paul Gillen and I will be back. Sanjeev Mohan is also in the house. You're watching CDO IQ from Cambridge, Massachusetts on theCUBE.